Welcome to another edition of Bitcoin Tech Talk. My name is Jimmy Song, and you can always get this newsletter at jimmysong.substack.com to get it into your inbox every Monday morning at 9 a.m. All fiat companies are zombies. Bitcoin Tech Talk issue number 269. A lot of businesses are huge. Citibank has 210,000 employees and IBM has 30,000. These are enormous organizations, historically speaking. Large organizations have a lot of disadvantages compared to small ones. They're not as nimble, they have a lot of management costs, and they're generally under more scrutiny. Large companies persist in this economy, which suggests that there are some advantages to being big. The main advantages are around scale. Big companies can get better prices for raw materials because they can buy a lot more of it, and the fixed costs, such as production equipment, are effectively spread over a large number of units being sold. They can also afford to do more research because that, too, can spread over a large number of units being sold. Yeah, when we look at big companies, innovation is not typically the word we associate with them. Big companies are much better known for having large lobbying efforts and not innovation. This wasn't always the case, of course. Bell Labs and Xerox Park are legendary in what they were able to produce through innovation. Attempts by large companies to make innovation happen inside are nearly always met with failure. For example, Blockchain R&D from IBM and Accenture were complete wastes of money. So what changed? What seems to have happened is that fiat money changed the equation for big organizations. Companies used to be evaluated purely by the market under hard money. The company that made products with market demand would win over the company that didn't. Goods and services had to be better in some fashion over what already existed in the market more convenient, better quality, cheaper, or having more features. This equation has changed as fiat money has entered the picture. Large companies now have an inherent advantage. They have access to low interest loans, which I've spoken about before. This lets them expand and delay paying for the expansion while the dollar debases. This can be a huge advantage in the economy as they now have an unfair advantage over their smaller competitors. Usually, the strategy ends up being lower prices, which generally requires even bigger scale to economically justify. The other major thing that, gives, that companies get as they get bigger is just the sheer number of workers. In a democracy, having a large number of workers is a big advantage politically. Employing a lot of people is grounds for the government to bail you out. Thus, even when a previously innovative company stops innovating, they tend to stick around. That starts their zombie existence as they use their bigness to get loans they didn't deserve to continue their existence. Many of these companies move from products to business services. Many of these services are of questionable value, yet they sell, often to government organizations. In other words, fiat companies are destined to becoming zombies living off the brains of the fiat system. No wonder so many people working at these places are so depressed. Fiat is a deep infection, one that can't be cured with just surface level changes. The whole thing needs to change, and Bitcoin is our hope against all these zombies. So I wrote this post, um, you know, just sort of thinking about like why the companies that exist are just so huge and what sort of advantages they get. And I've spoken about this before. The, the loans are the big thing, right? Like you get a huge amount of loans. You can do all sorts of things that smaller competitors can't do, including lobbying. But more than that, if you're employing just a huge number of people, now you become like demographically significant. And that's, uh, that, that leads to, you know, the government bailing you out. So auto workers, uh, in the auto industry got a huge bailout, you know, um, I don't know, it was like 12 years ago or something like that when, you know, they were going bankrupt because, of course, they had a lot of workers and that was like a big constituency and it was a political consideration. And in a sense, that that ends up being a big part of what uh, what ends up driving the government uh, sort of intervention in a lot of these industries. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to think of uh, the bigness from that angle because it really makes them want to get even bigger. Uh, let's talk about Bitcoin. Jameson Lop has his annual node software sync test. As expected, Bitcoin Core does the best. 
and seems to have improved from last year. GoCoin also seems to be a pretty fast implementation. Both Bitcoin Core and GoCoin seem to be benefiting from LibSec P256K1 speed improvements in the EC math operations. BTCD, Bcoin, and LibBitcoin are slower, mostly due to a lot of disk writes. So, um, you know, as expected, it's uh, Bitcoin Core that did the best. Um, but yeah, the blockchain keeps growing, so sync times are always having to, you know, keep up with that. But the LibSec optimizations uh, seem to be the big things, um, and there, there's a bunch of those that are in uh, that that have sort of come into Bitcoin Core. Jeremy Rubin sums up the next Bitcoin soft fork proposals as part of his Bitcoin advent series. He lists no less than 13 different possible primitives that are candidates for inclusion, including his op CTV. Jeremy does a great job explaining the, what the proposals are and what capabilities they would enable. One primitive I wasn't available of, uh, aware of is op there, an op code that checks that a certain transaction is in the same block. So a um, lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I think for Jeremy, he, he sees everything in terms of governance because that's, that's what he's involved in. And it does look like a lot, a lot of the soft work stuff is sort of geared towards that, uh, that sort of direction. So we'll see what happens with respect to that, but that, that seems to be the case here. Casa blog explains coin joins. The basic idea here is that the coin joins add privacy by making it harder to guess whose coin is whose. They also explain why an, 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 what an anonymity set is and why that's, an, uh, that's important for privacy. Finally, they explore pay joins as a way to defeat some coin join stuff. Um, they explain coin joins in sim very simple language very well here. Uh, so. Uh, you know, they're, they're talking about coin joins and how pay joins can basically do a lot of the things that pay, coin join would do in terms of privacy, but, you know, in a better way. So uh, really good post and worth reading in full. Wave Lake is a way for musicians to make money for their music using the Lightning Network. Their business model is that a musician can stream their music for Lightning Tips. They would be hosting their own music owning the distribution instead of relying on giant streaming platforms. It'll be interesting to see if this can become a profitable enough business model for artists. So um, the idea is that instead of, uh, you know, paying streaming networks or something like that, well, you would end up, uh, you know, hosting your own stuff and charging lightning. Now, whatever is paid has to overcome, uh, you know, the, uh, server costs and things like that. So I, I'm a, I, I don't know if it'll work, but it's, uh, it's an interesting idea. It's certainly Podcast Index is doing something similar, but there is enough, I think, uh, demand for music. So we'll see. Nodal has launched a Lightning-only hardware product. The product is aiming to be priced at under $200, which would be quite a feat. A consumer server that does Lightning routing would make the network more resilient and robust. I'm curious about what sort of specs such a system would have and what it will be able to do. So, um, you know, they, they're going to have some sort of lightning um, box. Uh, so this is like sort of an evolution from uh, the Bitcoin node box, uh, which a, a lot of them have lightning on it. Uh, but this would be lightning only. And the idea would be to get it down to a lower price point. So, um, you know, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll see if it becomes like a point of sale kind of device or something like that eventually. Uh, Lightning Labs has a new tool called Lightning Terminal. This is a web-based UI for managing your Lightning node, encouraging certain channel opens, and has a native way to access loop and pool so you can manage inbound liquidity. Once Lightning becomes a bigger part of the general ecosystem, I expect more homebrew lightning nodes to be a possible way for people to make money. Users are essentially doing the work that Visa does, but competing with each other. So that's the part I found really interesting is that if you have lightning terminal and uh, you can manage this thing, you can actually kind of make a business out of it, which would be very interesting in of itself. There's plenty of people that do, you know, Google ads and things like that. Uh, and that that's um, essentially decentralizing or distributing the type of advertising that you can do and so on. Um, and it gives you a lot more choices. Uh, that, that's essentially what Lightning does. You, you can be a bridge between two random nodes on the internet and make that work. Uh, so very interesting. 
uh, that this software now exists. The web UI uh, makes it very easy, I think. Um, and I look forward to it becoming a bigger part of this uh, payments ecosystem. Economics, engineering, etc. Lynn Alden explains why proof of stake doesn't work. Uh, the article is long, but worth reading as she expresses over and over again. The main problem is that proof of stake is a hugely centralizing force. She makes the intriguing analogy that Bitcoin likely would not have survived the 2017 block size war intact had the system been proof of stake. There's, sim there's simply too many subjective human decisions that are made centrally in proof of stake. So her point is that Proof of stake, let's face it, is very centralizing and you can't really get away from that. So uh, once you have some sort of centralized thing like proof of stake, well, then you're vulnerable to all the same things that, you know, centralized things tend to be. You get into politics and, um, you know, people do things for their own ends and so on. You're not really improving from the previous system at all. And that that seems to be what's happening here. Alex Leishman argues that Congress should treat Bitcoin like the Internet. His argument is that Congress should be light on Bitcoin regulation, much like Congress was on the Internet. I wonder, though, whether the opponents of Bitcoin won't lobby harder than the opponents of the Internet. And again, lobbyists for tech companies are some of the biggest today. So perhaps that's what it'll take. So <clears throat> a lot of... Uh, uh, of, of Congress, uh, you know, they they were kind of hands off on the Internet approach, although there were certainly a lot of, uh, you know, congressmen and senators and stuff that um, that that did try to do something, you know, more restrictive to the Internet. And those efforts failed that that led to this sort of like giant boom in innovation and in, on the in the Internet space. Um, and that that's his argument for how Bitcoin should be treated. Whether or not that actually happens is another thing entirely. Shinobi explains what a smart contract is and how the term has been disported, distorted by all corners. He dispels this FUD that Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracts by going back to the original definition. Unfortunately, altcoin advocates distort this term, usually to whatever capabilities their particular altcoin has. Word redefinition is a political attack, and we need to strongly refute them, making much as this article does. So, um, you know, a lot of these uh, altcoins like claim that Bitcoin does have smart contracts, but it's had them from the beginning. So it's it's this weird meme that's going around, and it really relies heavily on word def definition, what 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 a smart contract is and why. You know, uh, our platform is the only one that truly does it. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think Shinobi wrote an excellent article for that. Stefan Levera champions Bitcoin as the priority for libertarians. As he explains, the libertarian strategy in politics is sim simply has not worked, as can be evidenced by the encroaching statism all around us. Bitcoin is the opt out alternative, which lets libertarians build a new parallel system instead of trying to change the current one. Uh, current corrupt one. So um, libertarians, I think, haven't had that many electoral successes. I mean, there, there's a few, right? Like you get, uh, I, I think there was a representative from Michigan and, uh, you know, a lot of Republicans sort of claim libertarianism, but generally it's failed. And the reason is the strategy of political engagement just hasn't worked. Um, it, it, I, I trying to change the system from the inside is just kind of doomed to failure and bitcoin lets us sort of opt out that's that's the main reason uh that bitcoin works so much better goldman sachs is exploring bitcoin backed loans this is not a surprise given that unchain capital has had so much success with this product the intriguing possibility here is that they'd be able to give much lower rates which in turn would mean that there would be an easier path to leverage for a lot of people Given the scale of loans that firms like this are able to get, this could be a step toward hyper Bitcoinization. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I imagine there will be a lot more competitors to Unchain because they are doing fantastic. And uh, and Goldman Sachs probably, uh, you know, wants to get into this business. I imagine this, uh, you know, positions Unchain very, very well because they're, they're going to be like, OK, well, uh, you know, we're, we're the premier ones doing this. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, this sort of validates this business model significantly. Quick hits. Liquid has a PSBT extension for confidential transactions. This is uh, written by Andrew Polstra. 
And it's this idea that you can have, uh, you know, partially signed elements transaction or something to that effect where you can, uh, you know, have multi-sig and uh, get them signed by multiple parties and so on, even if it's a confidential transaction. Wyoming is aiming for 5% of Bitcoin hash rate by 2024. Um, that's fairly ambitious. We'll, we'll, we'll see if they can actually get there. That's, that's a lot of hash rate from the entire world. Um, the current and last SEC chiefs seem to agree that ICOs are security. So I, I really think this is coming at some point. I, I, I don't know why uh, people aren't seeing it, but these are securities and uh, the centralized nature will be revealed as these things get regulated. And, you know, I mean, you can shout decentralization all you want, but there's somebody that issued those tokens and that's clearly centralized. Tor doesn't seem to seem so anonymous anymore. So this is, uh, you know, some actor on Tor that seems to control a lot of the nodes. So it looks like government infiltration on Tor is um, or some spook or something is, is there. So it doesn't seem that anonymous. It has been a great year for smart contract lawyers of F smart contracts. <laughs> so uh, over a billion dollars has been taken from really badly formed uh, Ethereum smart contracts, which uh, the media for some reason likes to call hacks. But they're really smart contract lawyers that are doing um, you know, you know, finding holes in these things. So I, I don't see it that way. Uh, some events I am planning to be in London for Advancing Bitcoin, March 3rd and 4th. And there's some possibility I won't be able to go down to the UK. I'm also going to be at Bitcoin 2022 in Miami, April 6th to 8th. I'll also be doing the Programming Blockchain Seminars in London, March 1st and 2nd. And Miami, April 4th and 5th. All right, some podcasts and stuff on this week's Bitcoin Fixes This. I took listener questions and talked about Toproot and the possible next soft forks. I also read through last week's newsletter. Um, I talked with Robert Breedlove about Hoppe's Democracy the God That Failed. There's a lot more of the conversation that hasn't been released yet, but it's what you would expect, a lot of philosophical exploration of democracy as a system. So uh, we had a really good conversation and, uh, you know, like it's a very deep and interesting conversation at least it was for me so um i uh think you guys should check it out i also talked on the ba dallas business Cup podcast about the book thank god for bitcoin um arlena was very gracious uh very interesting sort of intersection between god and church and bitcoin and everything else uh, my other books are the little bitcoin book and programming bitcoin and I have another book coming out soon that explains Bitcoin for policymakers. So please stay tuned. I did work on that all of last week and we do have a manuscript, but and uh, we'll probably have a Kickstarter out shortly. Um, but yeah, we're, we're uh, we have the manuscript, but there's a lot of like production stuff that needs to happen, like the cover and back material endorsements, possibly a foreword and uh, Kickstarter and a book launch party. So all of that is coming. So please stay tuned. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this newsletter. I am an advisor and proud to be a part of a company that's enhancing security for Bitcoin holders. If you need multi-sig collaborative custody or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at Unchained.com. Fiat Belinda Est, this song is done.